right, we are recording. So um, this is just, uh, I've been working on this mini column idea and I present a little bit of, on multiple times. I'm gonna present some more on it today. Um, so this is, uh, I'll try to do a little bit of review, but I just wanna keep going forward. So um, it's just good for me to put this down and, and try to explain it to people and see if people understand it. So this is a slide I showed last time where I was, or a couple times ago, where I was explaining how we used to think of, how I used to think about a column where you get sensory input and then it gets this, uh, uh, an inference copy motor input from something below and it generates uh, motor outputs. And, and then, um, then we proposed, an, I proposed an alternate way, which is the new idea is that, um, that a column can actually, um, it doesn't need it's a motor reference copy, this, this uh, up facing dotted arrow now. Essentially, the idea is that a column can do path integration and know where its, its movements are going just by looking at flow information. And we're thinking mostly in vision, but I think this is going to apply everywhere. Um, so now the idea that you have two types of sensory input, a static input and a flow input. And that flow input is, is, uh, allows uh, the, the column to do path integration. And later, does it learn to associate um, a motor input efference copy and its motor output with some central pattern generator below? Um, so this should be somewhat, this is review, but maybe you don't remember it because you're all doing something else. But anyway, I, was, I argued, argued that input a sensory into a column into a column is divided into a uh, static and a flow portions. And when we run the flow bits uh, these, through the uh, spatial pooler like thing, we would define mini columns. And those mini columns essentially represent um, movement vectors, like how uh, the different sort of basis of movement vectors that, that the system can behave. Uh, and that is the essential beginning of the path integration modeling system. So just taking this idea here, the static flow in, uh, input and flow input, I went back and looked at the, the, the visual pathways again. And this is stuff we all, well, some of us know. Uh, I hadn't looked at it in a while, um, but I went back and reviewed it again. So this, for some people, this would be reviewed, some people, this would be new. But when input comes, so we're gonna look at how the input from the eyes uh, goes to the cortex. And uh, it goes through this thing called the thalamus, which is in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And this is sort of a, a pictorial diagram of it. Um, and the important thing I wanna get at here is that there's, there's th basically three types of cells that pass information from the eyes to, the, to, the, to V1. V1 is not shown here. This is that these uh, uh, pink and blue uh, things are part of the thalamus. So this is LGN and there's a left and right one. So they're showing you both sides. Uh, importantly, that the two, there's six layers here of cells and two of the layers, the blue ones are called magnocellular cells. And um, four of the layers are uh, pink ones are called parvocellular cells. And those, those are the primary divisions. The uh, magna just means that the cells are big, so the large cells. And parvo, I think, somehow means small. I don't know the derivation there. There's a third type of cell called a conocellular cell, which are, which are much poorer understood. And they're sort of in, in primates, they're interspersed uh, between the layers. So, um, this is, there's a natural division here between the magnocellular and the parvocellular. This is very well established uh, neuroscience. There's really almost no explanation for this, but here's how we can think about it. Um, magnocellular cells, uh, he, these are some of the properties of them. They have a very fast response, uh, meaning they're very quick to trigger. Uh, they have broad receptive fields. They're, they're not very precise in terms of the part of the retina that they're receiving input from. Um, they are not tonic, meaning they, they, if you look at a cell, it becomes active when, when, it, when its input changes. So if you have an onset of a, a signal or an offset of a signal, it, it'll fire, but if, if it will not continue to fire. It, it only it triggers on the, uh, on the transition between off and on and on and off. There's no color representation in the magnocellular cells. And this is ideal for flow detection. Uh, this is exactly what you would want for flow detection. You'd want, you want, you're trying to detect transitions you're trying to do it over a broad area um, and you need a very fast response and there's no point in having something like color. It doesn't really add anything to it. We're just really trying to find transitions. Um, the parvocellular cells, uh, on, by contrast, are slower. Uh, so they don't respond as quickly. Uh, they have very narrow receptive fields, so they're finely tuned and they do explain, uh, show tonic response. So if I put a dot of uh, light into a receptive field of a parvocellular cell, it stays active um, and they do represent color. And this is ideal for feature detection. So 
Um, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but the, 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 the speculated two roles of, of um, two different types of sensory input to a column uh, are clearly there and they match exactly uh, what, what I would expect. And I sort of, not, I, didn't, I, didn't, I knew this stuff, I hadn't thought about it when I presented this last time. I, I had not thought about this in a long time. And, and so I went back and looked at it and go, oh crap, look at that, it's perfect, just like exactly what I said. Um, so uh, I think that's a really nice fit. Um, interesting, the conocellular cells, there's very little known about them. Um, I had once before speculated a, a role for them. And in the, before, if you're following, in, in the earlier models, we thought about this, the way we thought a column, could, the way a column would know how movement was occurring, it had to have an efference copy, a motor efference copy. So it had to be receiving information from a, a motor area to the cortex. And when we looked at, um, you know, from the, from the thalamus, from the LGN, to the cortex, we needed a signal that might represent motion or, or behavior, or, you know, movement. And so I speculated that the conocellular cells would be that motor efference copy. That speculation still could be true because uh, I'm not saying there isn't a motor efference copy. There is a motor efference copy. It's just that we're not relying on it completely for, in fact, we're not relying on it initially at all for learning movement in the space of objects, in the space of movements. So that, that speculation is still possible. Uh, it could still play that role. Are, are these cells from the superior colliculus? Uh, yes, I think so. Well, then that would match your motor reference. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. The LGN, not the superior colliculus. Well, no, 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 they're coming from the superior they, colliculus. They, yeah, that's right. Where the inputs to the conocellular cells, I think, are coming from, I didn't mention that, but we, I think we verified that before. They're coming, uh, I, I, somebody I asked, I said, we need a signal that's coming from the superior, uh, from the superior colliculus to the cortex. Where might that be? And I forget who I asked that question to, um, but I asked several people over the years, um, and some neuroscientists suggested it might have been the conocellular cells. And I don't remember if there's a lot of good, the, the, the hard evidence for the conocellular cells, but I think there was evidence that there was coming from the superior colliculus. So I didn't, I, brought, I didn't look that up again today, but I, it, um, I'm, I don't remember exactly what it was, but whatever data I got from the people I spoke to was consistent with this idea. Right, so, it says that the ventralmost pair of uh, conicellular nuclei are tied to the function of superior colliculus, so they might be correlated. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so perfect. Maybe that was, the, yeah, not definitive, but certainly pretty close. So anyway, I think this is, um, um, I think the first two points here, the magnocellular and the parvocellular cells, this is, this is what's going on. I, there's, in my mind, I'm, this is almost certain. Uh, the conocellular cells, that's still a bit speculative, but we do need a signal from the superior colliculus to go to the V1, it wasn't clear up front that it would have to go through LGN. That's not clear to me. It just has to get from the spur colliculus to V1 or V2 and so on. Um, so anyway, that seemed like and no one else knew what those cells were doing. And so I said, well, then it could be. Um, the, uh, okay, so, so that I thought was a really nice uh, matching up with the theory uh, with, with this observation. And I, I would bet almost anything that we, if we go dig into the data for um, the thalamic relays for touch and um, um, in audition, we would find a similar uh, separation. I'm not saying that the thalamus would have the same uh, organization, but we would see two pathways. Uh, One question, is, is this uh, only the primate brain or does it go uh, to mice, rat, or other things? Uh, I know it goes to cats and... Uh, well, the parvo would only be for, I think it's, it's only for animals that have color vision. Well, well, so, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Well, I don't know if that's true. I, I think what you still need a, you would need a narrow receptive field and a tonic response, whether it's color or not, right? If, um, you, need a, a, you need an input which is gonna basically represent the feature of something and not the movement of the field. So I would think you would still have, a, you'd have to have, you'd have to have a division of two types of sensory input, regardless of whether you have color or not. The colors is an interesting thing because there are certain sensory features which don't really relate to movement and but would be useful for object discrimination and those those would be in that second pathway the parvocellular ones. Anyway, I think there's a really nice uh, mapping here and uh, I, I, any animal that's going to be able to model the world through vision or through touch or hearing is going to have I, I'm going to predict is going to have this separation of these two different um, sensory pathways. Uh, it's, it's, it, I think this is actually going on in region to region in the cortex as well. But I just wanted to just throw this out here right now. This is a, 
a very, there's no, as far as I know, there's no actual explanation for why those magnocellular cells and parvocellular cells. There's just observations about what they are. Uh, and now I have a very strong uh, theoretical uh, proposal why they're two different pathways and that they should be, we need them and they should be everywhere. Okay, let's go on. Unless there's more questions about that. Is there any more questions? Okay, um, here now, this whole thing got started by an observation of mine. The observation was, uh, I forget how long ago we did this, but a year or so ago, um, I, I made an observation, if you're watching someone playing a video game, uh, like, like this first person scene up here, um, and you're just watching it, you know how that player is moving. You, you know when they're going forward and backwards and turning left and turning right, you can learn a model of the environment just by watching the screen. Uh, you can get predictions about what's gonna happen. And so that, what that proved to me was that you didn't need an efference copy motor command to, uh, to track your location and to update your grid cells and, and place cells. That it wasn't, and so that told me that the data to do that must be coming from the sensory visual, the visual stream in this case. And that was the genesis of part of this whole idea was like, hey, I don't need an inference copy. I can do this all from sensory data. So just by watching, we sense how we're moving. We're able to track our location and orientation. And therefore, sensory data um, flow is sufficient for updating grid cells, play cells, et cetera. Uh, and I say here, the motor reference copy is advantageous, but not required. Meaning it is actually useful to know if I'm in control of this system, uh, the, the cortex would want to know what movements I'm generating because that's faster than, um, than relying just on sensory data. Sensory data is a reactionary thing. I see the thing starting to move to the left. And I go, oh, we're moving to the left. But if I'm actually controlling this, the joystick myself, I can take advantage of that. I can say, I'm about to move. And before I, you know, anything changes on the screen, my brain can predict what's going to happen, which can't happen if I'm not just observing it. So I'm not removing the importance of motor reference copy. I'm just saying it's not necessary. And it's not, in fact, I don't think it's the primary means by which we do this. So Jeff, uh, do you yep. mean that when, if you only use a sensory flow data, do you mean that you're like updating a running model of how this would happen? Or is this just a, a mapping from sensory data to uh, grid cells and coordinates? Uh, no, I, I, think, uh, I think sensory data is how we build the model. If you go back to um, this slide, um, mm -hmm. the idea here is you, um, the idea is, Here's a column and it's getting input and it's got a static input and a flow input. That would be the, that would be the um, parvo and the, and the magno so in, the, in terms of vision. And that this itself is how we learn the structure of the input space. This is, this is how we learn the structure of the input space. This is how a column builds up its model. And after it does that, or while it's doing that, it can then learn to associate um, uh, the movements that is detected in this flow input, it can associate them with, it says, oh, I, I know how you're moving. You're moving left or you're moving forward, you're moving back. And then it can associate that whatever system is generating that behavior. And, and then it can also associate the output of this system um, uh, with this as well. So this is a secondary step. It's not, it's not really the key thing. The key thing is that we're learning this uh, all from, this is, this is the, the whole idea here now is this is the system that is learning how the world works. Um, this is a secondary system that allows me to control the thing I'm uh, attached to. So you can imagine a column is just observing the sensory data and says, oh, I'm building a model of the world. Oh, I can see what's going on. I figured out this model. But until it has, it, just on itself here, it can't do anything about the model. Here, and now it says, oh, I can now control the thing that's moving. And I can now string together new movements to do new goals that the old system couldn't do on its own. Um, so this has become, this, these dotted lines are essential for uh, effectively uh, generating new behaviors, but they're not essential at all for learning the model of the world. Um, the model of the world can be learned purely through the sensory data. So one thing that's interesting to me is the fact that I think you probably, like I would suspect that when, uh, I, I agree that you can like infer all position and orientation and anything just from sensory data. Um, one thing that I think might be happening is that you also like generate fake uh, efference copies of like, you know, you invert the model and see like what, what action would create this and you're sort why, of playing along. Why would uh, you do that? Why do you need to do that? Well, look, for example, when you're in a, when you're in a car and you're not driving, many people get uh, car sick, right? Yeah. And the cool thing is that like, if, even if you're in the back seat, if you have like a fake little wheel, 
like a steering wheel thing and yeah. you use that, your car sickness goes away. Um, well, that's interesting, but I don't think that, I don't think that it necessarily implies that I have to do this reverse model. Um, well, I, I, I don't think it exactly implies it, but I'm, I'm suspecting that you, you do uh, this reverse model because a lot of what we, how we perceive things are like embodied, like embodied in this sense, right? They're in terms of like interaction, yeah. and how it might um, move something. Okay, well, that's, that's a finer point later. I mean- Yeah, the, yeah, sure. I was just- The, 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 the important thing here, the, the real key insight here is that the model is learned through sensory data and not, and we can learn a sensory motor model through sensory data. That the flow data allows me to figure out what movements are being performed in the world. And I can use that to build, a, uh, build up a model of a, a metric space and all the things and how behavior operates in that space. But um, do, you need the, do you need to have generated behaviors in the past to, uh, to actually have an accurate model of this? Or do you think- What, it, what it requires that, the, I don't show here, it requires that there's some other system that's generating behaviors. That's the CPG. So you're- To learn it, you need that. If the column is sitting on top of an old brain part or another part, some other system that's actually doing something. That other system is getting inputs and it's generating behaviors. The column doesn't know what, anything about it. it. Doesn't know how sophisticated that is. It just says I'm sitting on top of, and I'm observing, I'm observing the, uh, essentially the results of somebody else moving the sensor around. And I'm just gonna watch it and see what happens. And then from that, I build up a model of, of the thing that this CPG is interacting with. The old brain. So the, you can think of it, the old brain. You can think about uh, another part of the cortex. It doesn't really matter. There's a, a column sitting there going, I'm looking at something. I'm getting some sensory input. I'm going to figure out what this is. But there's an assumption that there's somebody else generating that behavior. And, um, and I'm going to observe the results of their behavior. And by observing the results of their behavior, I can now build a model. And once I have that model, I can associate my model with the actual behaviors are being generated below and I can now control them. Uh, I can now string together novel sequences of uh, uh, behaviors to achieve new goals that were not achievable by the old system. You can think of, in some cases, the simplest case, the CPG could be a hardwired system that has no flexibility at all. And, uh, and then the cortical column would say, oh, I can now direct you to do new things to achieve goals that you don't know how to do at all. Um, and, but, but, um, or it could be the CPG could be a very highly learned system and, 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 the, and it could be another part of the cortex and this could be a very high rel, a high level, uh, uh, region. And it's looking at a part of the cortex is also learning. So it says, okay, you've learned something and you're doing all these sophisticated behaviors, but I'm looking at more stuff and I'm going to build even a more sophisticated model. Um, I can, can we take a, a like, a, it's just not even giving me. Okay. Uh, let's get, the, I, I want to spend, I want to make this short, so I don't want to go too far, but the, uh, another question, Aris? Oh, sorry. I just wanted to understand. So is the CPG basically necessary for the column to learn the model was basically? No, right? it's not a question. It's not required to column to learn a model of, of the thing that the CPG is interfacing with. It's necessary. It's the connect. Uh, it's, it's, well, the CPG is necessary to have somebody moving the sensor in some structured way. Right. So there's yeah. been this research on. Um, I'll be quick with this. There's been this research on uh, kids that were uh, raised born blind and they have their cataracts removed when they're like eight or nine years old. Yeah. And then they they're basically functionally completely blind after that. Uh, and the only yeah. way that they can get to like uh, understand like borders and shapes and all of that is when they need to start interacting in a closed loop with the objects to move them around and like. Yeah, yeah, but but you know at that point the whole brain is screwed up. So I. <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on, I, I, I don't, I want to focus on that. I want to focus on uh, these very sort of basic primitives here. We can worry about the edges later, okay? I, no, no, I but I, what I'm trying to say is like, you, it might be necessary for you to learn a sensory motor model based on your own actions first before you can use one that's based no, on- No, I'm, cla I'm claiming that's not true. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm almost certain it's not true in this case. Um, it, 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 because you, there's other reasons I haven't gotten into. You can, the, the, the column cannot know anything about what motor, its output can do. It has no way of generating behaviors initially. It, it has to, those dotted lines have to be learned. And so a, a, a cortical column can, never controls muscles directly. And then there's not a single layer five cell in the cortex that goes to a muscle. So you can't, the cortex can't have any behaviors until it has learned a model of the world and, and how the thing it's talking to and uh, is generating behaviors. And then it can associate its model with those behaviors. I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, we can debate it later, okay? Okay. Um, um, anyway, so, so I wanna go back to this thing. 
So this is the observation which led me to this idea that you don't need an inference motor copy. All you need to do is look at the sensory data. And I was, and you just have to imagine that the column, there's, there's some brain that's looking at this scene, the cortex, and it has no idea what behaviors are being generated, but it just immediately says, oh, I know what behaviors are, I can, I can infer, or I can learn what behaviors are going by just observing how the flow bits change. I don't think this is hardwired. I think it learns how the flow bits change and says, oh, those are the behaviors that are being executed here. Now, I had a similar observation, and, and this is getting a bit more speculative now. Um, it's, it's a similar idea, but imagine, imagine now that I'm, I, I couldn't figure out how to get a movie in my PowerPoint presentation. So you just have to accept it like this. Imagine now I'm holding an object in my hand, or somebody's holding it, or just I'm, I'm observing an object like this coffee cup. And now the coffee cup starts moving. It can be rotating around. Yes. Okay, okay. So this observation is the following. If I move an object, like the, like the cup, and I rotate it around in different positions, or any object, why do I not feel like I'm moving through space? What I feel is the object is moving. I'm, it, so I have flow bits changing, just like I did on the left panel here. I have flow bits changing, now I have flow bits on the right changing, but I don't I have a different perception. I, the perception is I'm not moving, um, the perception is the object is moving. And um, which is a curious thing. Why would that be? Well, you know, what's the difference? Well, the difference here is that in, in the left case, there was a, the flow bits, there was flow occurring over the entire field of view. In the right, the flow is only occurring over a small part of the field of view. Um, and that's the only difference. And so why would, you know, that tells me, since this is a very important clue. It's just like, okay, I don't feel like I'm moving anymore. I feel the object is moving. So this leads to this idea here, and I'm going to, I'm going to go through this really quickly because the plumber is waiting. He gave me five minutes. Um, um, the idea is, you remember, we go back to our cortical column. And on the left, we, we know there are three separate points where uh, input from the, uh, the LGN is if the V1 column enter. Um, there's this, the lower layer three, there's the lower layer five, and there's layer four. And what I'm going to argue here is that, um, at least the idea, and I call this speculation, is that uh, when, we, when we think about uh, the magno cells, this is the ones that would be the, the flow cells. Those are the ones I'm, I'm arguing are going into lower layer three and lower layer five. They are determining the movement commands. But I'm gonna argue that there's a narrow field of view for the upper ones and a broad field of view for the lower ones. Um, and, and if you recall, the receptive fields in the layer five and layer six are much wider than the receptive fields in layer two and four, plus layer two, three, and four have uh, end stop, meaning that if you get larger, they stop responding. So there's clearly already a well-established idea that upper layers have a narrower field of view than the lower layers. And, and now we see this sort of parallel thing here. We have this, we might have two separate recognition systems going on here. Um, in the bottom, where we have a large field of view, that's like looking at the gamer. And we're looking, and what you, if you walk through what happens there, what you're really doing is modeling egocentric movement. You're modeling how my body is moving through space. Um, so my body's turning left, my body's turning right, it's going forward, it's going backwards, that kind of stuff. But if I have this, this uh, narrow field of view, which, um, which is the, like the rotating cup, uh, I no longer perceive, it, I, I don't think of it as movement. Um, I think it's the object is moving. And so what I would be doing is, um, I would, be, I would be modeling the movement of the object as opposed to the movement of my body. It would be an allocentric movement. Uh, there's still flow bits going, but the assumption is because it's only a part of the visual field that, that those movements are being executed by the object, not by me. I don't know how this works yet, but the idea is you, it, it, we might, I'm, I'm working on this idea that the upper things are basically trying to model the object in the object space, or it, at least partial in the object space, an allocentric movements in an object model. And then in the bottoms are going to be a, a egocentric movement in a body space model. And of course, we have to go back and forth between them. We have to, and somehow we might be able to figure out how we're going between the allocentric and the egocentric uh, uh, reference frames in this particular case. I don't have any details on that yet, but it's, um, but it's an intriguing idea, at least. I, and I, was, I thought I'd just throw it out there because it's kind of interesting. It fits a lot of data and we need to make this transition from egocentric to allocentric space someplace in the cortex. Um, that's a requirement. It happens right away. Um, right as soon as you get the V2, you start seeing more allocentric type of representations. So um, anyway, this is the idea I'm working on, which I think is a pretty, a pretty interesting idea. And then uh, I'll just throw in one last thing is, 
Layer five, of course, these are our motor cells here, at least some of them are, and those would be egocentric motor commands, so you, which is what we need. We need to be able to send a signal back down to some part of the brain that says, yeah, I want you to move in this egocentric way. That's what the commands of the body have to be in. Um, but then we might be going back and forth between these two um, spaces represented here. Um, so uh, that's, that's the idea I'm working on right now, and that'll be done. And if, if you have real brief questions, fine. Otherwise, I got to go take care of the uh, plumber. <laughs> I don't have any brief questions, but I have more discussion for some future time. I'd love to do that. Um, yeah, can we set a discussion up maybe like for Wednesday or something? Uh, for, well, if if someone Wednesday. wants to set that up, that'd be fine with me. Okay. Uh, I do want to say one last thing. I said it was done, but I'm going to show you one last thing. No, nope, it's not this one. Um, you guys see this? You see those patterns on there? You see this paper? Are you seeing these uh, moray patterns on the screen now? No, we still see a PowerPoint. No, I still see the slide. You, you're probably sharing specifically a PowerPoint. Oh, uh, uh, you are sharing. Uh, how do I share? How do I new share? Uh, new share. You probably have to stop this sharing one. and then. No, share this one. Now you see it? Yes, you see it? we see it now. OK, so this is a real quick thing. Here's a great paper. I'm reading it. I'm, I've read it twice, but I've only gotten halfway through it both times. Um, and Luke Lewis will remember this, perhaps maybe some other people. Lewis, remember I bought him those little wire screens once, these two pieces of wire screens, maybe some of the other, I don't know if I showed them to anyone else. I know I showed them to Lewis. And, yeah, you, yeah, you showed them. And, and, I, and I was thinking, these remind me of grid cells, right? Where you had these two screens and you rotate them and slide them and you get all these moray patterns. And there's a, here's this paper, a 2007 paper. It's about how, it's a, this is a mind blowing paper. I don't know why Florian didn't bring this up when he was talking about the, the models of grid cells. This is an alternate model for grid cells that is speculating that they're really moray interfer interference patterns, exactly the thing I showed in that, on those two missions. And I won't walk you through it yet. I'm gonna, I will do it in a future time. It's a great, it's a really fascinating paper. I don't know if it's right, but it's fascinating. But there's, they're basically showing how, uh, they're arguing that grid cells are essentially um, um, derived from smaller field, smaller uh, grid fields, and, they're, and what you're really observing is a moray pattern. And it, and it, 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 um, it explains a whole bunch of experimental data that other people haven't been able to explain. Um, and, and it's got some issues too, so, but it's fascinating. And um, I just thought I'd mention it because I'm gonna talk about it in the future. Um, it's, a, it's a really nicely written paper, although it's hard to get all the way through it. Um, so that'll be for next time. And if that's, if that's okay, then I'm gonna excuse myself. <laughs> uh, and we'll pick this up at a future time. I apologize for the shortness of this, but we were dealing with plumbing problems in the house and I don't know where my wife is, so I'm, I'm sitting here dealing with the plumber. Okay, <laughs> he's, ready no to, he's, he's ready to go and I'm like, he's, he needs to talk to me. Um,